I got a brand new, practically, workable and effective wheelchair for my needs. And here's the kicker. The state would have spent $19,000 to give me a wheelchair that would lead to my injury and decline. Libertarians did this for six and a half thousand dollars. The state would take up to two years to deliver me that wheelchair that would not be adequate. Uh, libertarians had it crowdfunded, purchased, traded, shipped, and modified in two months. Can I pause for a second and, and just note that uh, we got Brian on here who's getting uh, Congressman Massey on, and our typical lineup includes like homeless people that believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> Welcome to the Brian Nichols Show, your source for common sense politics on the We Are Libertarians Network. The Brian Nichols Show is the fastest growing liberty podcast that brings together people from all means of political thought as we seek to have meaningful conversations about the issues you care about. At the Brian Nichols Show, our goal is to leave the audience educated, enlightened, and informed. And now your host, Brian Nichols. Well, happy Wednesday there, folks, and thank you, yes, for joining us on another fun-filled episode of The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our episode back on Monday with Chris Goizetta. We talked, of course, all things marketing, and we specifically focused on the customer journey, but specifically how we can make that customer journey bring our fans to become what? ultimately super fans. That's right. So if you missed that episode, make sure you head back uh, to Monday's episode here on the Brian Nichols show, but you are in store for, of course, another phenomenal episode. And yes, another phenomenal guest today. I am joined by the former 52nd state Senate district in New York candidate who ran for the Libertarian Party back in 2020, and he's a disabilities advocate. Thomas Queter joins the program today, and he discusses how one of the most awful words it is to hear someone say, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. How he has experienced time and again government getting in the way when you think that it'd be able to help those folks in need. At the very least, isn't that the role of government to help the people who are the most in need, well, Thomas digs into how actually government ends up exacerbating the problem in many instances and how the private sector and crowdfunding has not only helped him directly, but has helped cut costs and provide a better service in a much more timely fashion than otherwise would have happened. A great conversation with Thomas to be had. So with that being said, on to the show, Thomas Queter here on The Brian Nichols Show. Hi, thank you for having me. You Absolutely. Thank you, Thomas, for joining the program. And, and thank you for uh, running in, in 2020, as I teased in the intro, as a big L libertarian. And correct me if I'm wrong, you you received the most votes in New York in 2020. Is that correct? Yeah, I received, uh, on the libertarian line, I received over 13,000 votes, which was the most last cycle for New York. Um, and, and also the, the highest percentage. Which um, is a big deal. New York is tough. They hate third parties. Yeah, yeah. And, and I... I uh, I, I came out of the woodwork. I came out of nowhere. I was a new libertarian. Um, I, I actually joined the party in 2019. Uh, I've been libertarian since Gary Johnson, uh, but I'd actually never been registered for another party because I never found a home in another party. And uh, once I started listening to libertarian advocates, libertarian candidates, uh, in particular Larry Sharp, I, I, I realized, hey, I'm a libertarian, and I've been doing libertarian stuff all my life. Isn't it funny how that happens? I, I'm finding more and more of this, Thomas, and I would love to hear you maybe dig in a little bit about your libertarian story, because you, you, you kind of found yourself, right, being a libertarian and just doing libertarian things just because it kind of does go into this mindset, and my, my audience, they know by now, it's this idea of what? Don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Like, at that very fundamental core belief... I think your average good person believes that. I'm seeing that in my office. I'm seeing that in my circle of friends. I'm seeing it pretty much everywhere. So kind of walk back, Thomas, when you're doing your libertarian discovery, your libertarian journey, what was it that you started to identify as being those kind of connectors of your own personal beliefs with these ideas of libertarianism that you started to gravitate towards? So for me, it all starts with health care, um, excuse me, health care and volunteerism. Um, I am a disabilities advocate. Uh, I am not beholden to any organization. Nobody pays me. I find individuals like myself who are left out of the systems. I mean, we have um, disability welfare 
and in New York, you know, our health care is now our welfare, so you have to qualify for one to get the other. It's it's very complex, it's very convoluted, and it leaves a lot of people without while spending a lot of money and shouting that they're helping everybody. And that's really not the way it works. So I, I spent, I think I'm pushing over eight years now, uh, time flies, <laughs> actually reaching out to the individuals who the government didn't help and showing them how to help themselves and, and how to rally their communities and their families to help them. Uh, sometimes you run into individuals who, who don't have that kind of support, uh, don't have family support, that aren't well integrated into their communities. And, and so that really got to reach out to the people around them. But that's volunteerism. That's voluntarily solving a problem. And, and despite the fact that I had been doing this for almost seven years at the time, when I ran into the situation where I was without, um, I had applied for a wheelchair that I had received uh, five times prior to the system since I was 15 years old. Wow. Same, man, same model, same brand, denied and told I could only have one that would injure me and put me in a, in a, a state of decline, right? Um, and in the process of trying to save myself from that, I found the exact model of chair, older but completely unused, that I needed. And two of my libertarian friends, because we'd all become libertarians, um, basically had an argument with me. They spent two days convincing me to allow them to do what I did for others, to crowdfund the wheelchair. The, the interesting thing here is I got the same exact make model that I needed, but I actually got better suspension than I'd ever had before to the systems. Um, I got a brand new, practically workable and effective wheelchair for my needs. And here's the kicker. The state would have spent $19,000 to give me a wheelchair that would lead to my injury and decline. Libertarians did this for six and a half thousand dollars. <laughs> um, the state would take up to two years to deliver me that wheelchair that would not be adequate. Uh, libertarians had it crowdfunded, purchased, created, shipped, and modified in two months. I'm writing my notes down just because so nineteen thousand dollars in yep. two years, six thousand dollars, two months. Six and a half. Wow, that's a big number, Thomas. Yeah. How does that happen? So how does that happen? How, how do we get to a point where we see a wheelchair that somebody can get on the open market in two months' time for over half less than what the government was going to get it for you? How do we get there? So this particular wheelchair was, was technically used. It had a few days of what I would call use. Uh, I'm a heavy wheelchair user, so um, it had, I think, 46 hours of use. There's, there's an hours counter on this model. Um, and, and what happens to medical equipment often enough is it's purchased for someone who doesn't have that much longevity or it's purchased and is incorrect for someone. And what will happen to that piece of equipment is if it's lucky, it will go to a, um, a, a closet type program. A lot of nonprofits run an equipment closet where they, they loan out or give away used equipment that people need and can't get otherwise. Those are wonderful programs. If you have one near you, support it. People need it. Um, but this was a privately purchased chair 20 years ago that never got used and sat around for 20 years. So the solution here is, is keeping your mind open. You know, One of the problems I have when I'm addressing an individual who has needs that are not being met is convincing them that there are other options besides the government. Yeah. No. Well, let's talk about that then, because we see too often than not. And I, I see it in my circle of influence as well with people I talk to, people I love. They say, yeah, but Brian, without the government, who would do X? Right. So let's address that, Thomas. And, and you're seeing it right now. Crowdsourcing will help you and it can help people like you, other people out there who are in need of help. But what about the other people who are suffering right now? I guess that's where that middle ground and that conversation always gets tough because there are people right now who are relying on the government welfare, the government assistance, just to make it through the day, to make it through the week, to put food on the table for the families. For those folks, how do we help them in that interim time? So what we're really talking about here is community resources. Um, 
when the government taxes your community, they take resources out of your community. Um, and no offense to our social workers and people who work in these structures of government programs. Right. Most of them care. Social workers are near and dear to my heart, by the way. Um, but there is a severe inefficiency in taking money out of, say, Mount Upton, where I live, sending it to Albany and through all of these horribly complex bureaucratic systems to get back to me. There's a lot of money lost. Then we have government control of industry in medicine and in medical devices including wheelchairs. So what happens is the government comes through with a cap on line item pricing. The cap on a power wheelchair in New York is $19,000. So guess what every power wheelchair in New York costs? Oh my gosh, is it $18,999.99? I, I would be surprised if they didn't harvest that extra cent. <laughs> um, and and when, when you do that, then you've got companies making essentially something they could maybe be sell, selling for 5000 and, and, and viably now charging 19 and instead of it being on the end user or their community, if their community is helping them, it's on the taxpayer at a broad scale. And that's why you end up seeing specialized models of wheelchairs like my own left out. Now, here's the thing. They say your precondition is covered, right? That's, that's the going thing with the ACA particularly in New York with the Medicare for All push. Um, well, covered for what? I technically was covered for a wheelchair that would lead to my decline. Is that what I want to be covered for? Is that what you want to be covered for? Um, and and that, that's, that's very fundamental to our health care is our individual needs. So if I can, Brad, can I turn this around and ask you a question? Please. Please. What do you know about my specific disability situation. How much do you know? Very little. Yeah, You know what? Doctors, same boat. They know very little. Um, I choose my doctors by the doctors that ask me because I'm the only expert in my condition. Because my condition is a spectrum condition with many different variations. And you see this in most disabilities. You can rarely find two people with the same disability who are in the same disability situation. And when we start cookie cutter applications of healthcare, we leave out everybody who doesn't fit in that nice little gingerbread man shape. Um, and, and this happens to all of us. Um, eventually, aging becomes a disability. Unless, unless you're um, a victim of an accident or a sudden heart attack or something to that, you, you will sustain life for a significant period of time with a disability. And I had an interesting situation last cycle when I was running, I was shopping and I ran into this elderly gentleman, a Democrat. And I was wearing my campaign shirt and he asked me about it and we got talking about it. And turns out he's a stroke victim hmm. and a Democrat. And you know, his first statement to me once the light bulb went off, we're talking about healthcare, right? And, and government systems. You know, his statement was, you know, I never realized these systems weren't really built to help me. Wow. Wow. And they're not. They're not. Um, most of these bureaucratic systems, like the universal assessment uh, system in New York, it, it's actually designed to kick people off. Um, another good conversation I had was with a former welfare fraud investigator. Um, I actually met him in the lobby of a hockey rink down in Broome County. Um, his position, his, his statement on this, was that welfare fraud is kind of a, a joke. Um, hmm. he, he, he was very emotionally upset to talk about this. And, you know, he stated, you know, most of our job is kicking people in need off of the system. He wasn't actually finding people who were fraudulent. He was finding people who forgot a comma or didn't check the right box. And, and largely, that's usually in the hands of a social worker who is often unsupported. Right? Their jobs are harried. Their jobs are hectic. They spend more time on paperwork than helping. Uh, quite often, they actually have to go to these individuals that they get to know. Right? They know them. They know their needs. They gain an understanding of the situation. And they have to say, I'm sorry but I'm not allowed to help you. Put yourself in their shoes and imagine how that feels. 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not allowed, I'm not to, allowed help to help you. How I mean, how, how, I mean, profound, how profound is that, is that a statement? A statement? To, hear to hear somebody actually say the words, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And for many of the, these people, they are quite literally the only resource that's available to them. And the only resource is not in a position to actually offer the help they need. I mean, folks, is, is it not obvious how broken the system is? And then let's let's look from the medicine side of things, Thomas, because now you have a system, number one, where we can't help people who are in need right now. And then when they are looking for, for just means of trying to make it through the day, they're just push drugs down their throat to, to numb the, the symptoms. It's not actually mm -hmm. taking care of the underlying problems. And with you being a disabilities advocate, you've been a strong proponent of legalizing marijuana. Let's kind of transition the conversation that way because I think you kind of leading the charge and helping raise up the importance of not just, and this is the narrative we see, right? The dangers of drugs and the dangers if government were not to regulate. I'm saying, no, what about the dangers when government does regulate? What's that experience like for you? So I can actually speak very, very uh, pointedly on that. I was, I was eight years old the first time that a doctor prescribed me an overdose of opiates. Wow. Uh, I went on to have many problems with that through my teens. Uh, but interestingly, I was 10 years old the first time a doctor, and there were several before it was legal, recommended that I try cannabis. Now, mind you, this started in 1993. It was illegal that those doctors were, were risking their licenses. Um, they were technically doing something illegal by recommending that this disabled child try cannabis for pain instead of the opiates that were obviously giving him severe troubles. Um, and, and so being a libertarian-minded kind of person, uh, by, the, by the age of 13, I was using cannabis. And, and to that point, I'm going to turn 38, right? Yes, <laughs> 38. Uh, in nine days, June 24th, I, I will turn 38. And, and on June 30, uh, on June 25th, <clears throat> I will be 38 years older than expected at birth and 17 years older than the last life expectancy a doctor gave me. Now, and there's two factors to that. One is cannabis. Uh, it has been shown that uh, CBD in particular uh, decreases the healing time and increases the strength of healed bone. The number one symptom of my condition is brittle bones. I had over a thousand fractures by the time I was 16. Why wouldn't I want CBD and, and why is the government keeping that away from people? Um, uh, further, you know, if we're talking about the FDA, I defied the FDA when I was 15 years old. Woo! Think about that. Um, what a bold ninth grader you were, Thomas. Jeez. Right? Well, my, my parents were, were, they were both working parents, hardworking parents. Um, I've, I'm personally still below the poverty line. Um, my family had been below the poverty line, line for most of my life. Um, the interesting part of how I just divide the FDA, there's this, this realm of drugs called bisphosphonates, and there's one called pomegranate that I use. Pomegranate in particular had been allowed, had by get that allowed by the FDA uh, for low bone low bone density situations like if you've gone through chemo, if you're severely uh, osteo, uh, if you have severe osteoporosis, uh, and, and even for Paget's disease, it had been approved since the mm. 70s for many other low bone density conditions. Uh, in 1998, I had to defy the FDA as a child without help to receive the drug that brought my fracture rate at the time from over 100 a year down to less than one. Uh, I think I've only had one fracture in the last two years. Wow. What? Yeah. Sorry. That's, that, yeah. that, that's insane, though. Like, the fact, and, and right there, I mean, we saw this in COVID, right, Thomas? I mean, the FDA was pretty much standing in the way of a vaccine. I mean, they stood in the way of the, the masks that work, don't work, I don't know anymore. Does Dr. Fauci even know anymore? But they stood in the way of that. They stood in the way of the vaccines being rolled out. I mean, pretty much immediately, I think the, the, the number I saw, they had the vaccine figured out 
a week after a pandemic was declared. A week. A week. And the FDA was in the way. The MoFo FDA. And, and I mean, like right there, how many millions of lives across the planet could have been saved had the FDA not been in the way? I'm just saying. I mean, and that's something that people don't really think about. They think of, well, if we had just done the lockdowns, Brian, then we wouldn't have had to worry about that. And I'm like, that's anti-human. Let's maybe look at something like, you know, getting government out of the way of increasing innovation, of, of finding the, the tools out there that are needed and that we can actually test to see if they work. And I don't know, a global pandemic seems like a more important crisis than ever to uh, to go ahead and maybe get some of those regulations that have been holding people back out of the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm at risk for anything that's respiratory because of the suppression of my lung capacity by my rib cage grouping with soft bones, um, which is not as bad as it would have been without the, the treatment that I received. So, you know, the FDA is an interesting bag. You know, it, it also tells us that a Pop-Tart is healthier than an avocado. <laughs> what, what would your reaction be if somebody said that to your face? Oh, you'd laugh. You'd, you'd honestly laugh. And, and you should. And, and, you know, we see these regulations from the FDA and their, their processes. You know, it, it, the FDA is solely responsible for millions of people uh, enduring cobalt poisoning. Dig into that. I don't. I didn't hear about this. Tell me more. <laughs> this comes on the medical equipment side, uh, and specifically with hip replacements. Um, all manner of hip replacements are grandfathered by one commonality with a previous hip replacement. So uh, at one point, the manufacturer was using cobalt in the manufacture of hip replacements. Cobalt is toxic. When it's in your body, particularly at certain levels, it causes dementia-like symptoms. Who gets hip replacements? Hmm. People who are coming up on, on senility and and the average age of diagnosis for things like Alzheimer's. So there's actually uh, a significant number of people misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's because they were given a hip replacement that contained cobalt. And they had cobalt poisoning the whole time. Yeah. Get out of here. Now, how did that happen? How, how did the FDA miss that? Uh, well, because of their... their um, their grandfathering process, if you will. Uh, basically, if there's one similarity to something previously uh, previously approved, then it's automatically approved. We don't look into it. So, so hold on. So let's just make sure the audience is is seeing this entire picture painted. So the FDA tests something. It passes through. It's then grandfathered in. They don't really look at it ever again to see if there maybe is a long-term ramification. So then you go fast forward 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and lo and behold, because they haven't been looking and testing and, and basically holding, they're, they're eliminating any responsibility on behalf of the original provider to actually make sure that the product isn't causing some negative externality. So now it's a matter of quite literally finger pointing, saying, well, it's not my fault. It's the FDA's fault. They didn't do anything about it. And the FDA is saying, well, it's your product. And and then it's it's nobody's nobody's fault well it's everybody's fault but it, it, did i paint that picture at least fair yeah, yeah so it's, it, it would be important to point out that the first hip replacement um equipment did not contain cobalt one that contained cobalt was one generations later but all of those generations had been approved by having something similar in common with a previously approved hip replacement <laughs> no kidding oh, geez. Geez. well that's getting weird. I mean, is there is uh, how about this? Because we are getting close to the end of the show. Is there something to look forward to? I mean, are things hopefully getting better? Are these kind of conversations changing the dialogue? Yeah, actually, um, I just saw that Montana is making great strides towards a freer market of health care. When, when we have a freer market, we have a accountable market. I think that's one great way to go. Something else I'd like to point out here. I'm also a, a big 2A advocate. Um, I believe in our Second Amendment rights. And there's one statistic I always like to point out. Wheelchairs make the top 30 list of most dangerous consumer products quite regularly. Guns do not. What? How's and that? Because they're shoddy. Because of the, the regulation and, and the way it's uh, handled through the systems. There's no incentive to provide a good wheelchair. When I go down the road with my chair that I have that's crowdfunded and other people in wheelchairs see it, 
they ask me where they can get one, and I have to tell them, I'm sorry, the government put that company out of business. Wow. Tom, for 52.com, your YouTube, your YouTube vis, uh, visitor here and YouTube watcher is looking at the screen, and they've probably been wondering this whole time, so is this the, the website from the past campaign? It is, but it might be a campaign website for a future campaign as well, Thomas. Dig into that a little bit. So it's absolutely the same website for my future campaign because I'm running for the same race. Uh, I'm not the kind of person that's going to take uh, – something like 12 or 14% of the vote and walk away, I'm, I'm going to come back. The interesting thing is the incumbent is not coming back. Um, but, uh, you know, last cycle, most of my da donations ranged between 5 and $100, and, and we did outrage, outraise the last two Democrats that ran in this race. And I'd like to do that again. So if you've got 5 or $10 and, and you want to look at my, my uh, policy, if you want to learn more about me, uh, go to the website, check it out, consider a donation, consider a recurring donation. But uh, I, I want to be the guy that runs from the bottom up. If you've got five bucks and you can help me out. Five so, bucks. Five. It can change the world. I don't think people realize. So, and here I'll give a free plug completely just because you said five bucks and I, that came into my head because our friends over at Liberty Memes, they have a $5 a month charity club. It's a group on Facebook. And they're, I'm getting actually goosebumps talking about it because they're changing people's lives. Um, and it starts with a $5 donation from one of the most active and thoughtful groups I've ever been a part of um, and completely an entirely selfless group. And, and David Andrew Gay, I, I cannot praise him enough for helping lead that charge over at Liberty Meme. So, yeah, completely – Un unnecessary sponsorship, but I mean, my goodness, they're doing great work, and I want to make sure I'm giving them a bunch of love. But with that being said, Thomas, we are unfortunately at the part of the show where we have to get ready to say goodbye. But before we do, we have the website, Tom for 52 folks, and go ahead and find you there. But I'm assuming we have some social media plugs as well. Fire away. So I am on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and actually you can find those links at the website. And, you know, it, you got to look into it. At least read it. There's some great policy there, and you can learn all about me. And, you know, we're going to be coming out with some pretty snazzy T-shirts in the next month or two. Ooh. Yeah, I don't want to describe it too much, but there was a meme made of me recently, and and we've been, we've actually asked that person to redo the meme a little bit, and we're going to be putting it on the, on the well, website. Ooh, well, how about this? You you let me know when that comes up. I'll make sure I go ahead. We'll give it a, a free little plug here on the show because that sounds like going to be a, a a nice little uh, shirt we can go ahead and raise some awareness for. But otherwise, that being said, Thomas, thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you for helping raise awareness to, yes, uh, the fact that there are people out there in the government who have to look at people and say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. We're going to change that. And it starts with us presenting the solutions out there that are going to help real people right now. Thank you, my friend, for joining the program. Help someone today. Live with yourself tomorrow. Alrighty, folks, that's going to wrap up my conversation with Thomas Queter. If you enjoyed the episode today, will do me a favor. Go ahead and make sure you share today's episode. And when you do, make sure you go ahead and tag yours truly at B Nichols Liberty Twitter, Facebook, Minds.com, and Parlor.com. Also, please make sure you go ahead and tag Thomas. I'll make sure I include his links in the show notes. And folks, if you really enjoyed today's episode and you think that the conversation that we had today is making a difference. So I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. Number one, head over to briannicholshow.com forward slash reviews and let us know. I would love to hear about it. And guess what? So would other people out there who are looking to solve the problem that just like Thomas, they see before them, they're going to be looking for options out there. Let it be that your review helps guide them to possibly one of the most important solutions they have ever uncovered in their life, briannicholshow.com forward slash reviews. Give us a quick five-star rating and review and let folks know what value you got from today's episode. I would love to hear about it as well. Also, if you want to go ahead and keep these kind of conversations growing, well, you can go ahead and support the show in a couple different ways. Number one, if you want to go ahead and get your sales acumen just absolutely skyrocketing, but hey, maybe you're looking at running for office or you're already running for office and you want to get some nitty gritty in terms of sales and liberty marketing as it pertains to liberty politics and candidates running for office, head over to our Patreon here at The Brian Nichols Show 
$5 or $10 a month, you'll be entered into these awesome classes with amazing folks in the greater Liberty world, as well as some uh, really amazing experts in their greater fields of influence. So I'm so excited for the folks here at the Brian Nichols Show Patreon. And of course, if you do sign up to uh, be a member of the Patreon, you get one of these awesome don't hurt people and don't take people stuff bumper sticker. But hey, if you really like this bumper sticker, right? Because it is pretty awesome. And you want to go ahead and get a copy and you're like, Brian, I can't go ahead and do a $5 a month contribution. Sorry, man. I get it. It's okay. Here's what you can do instead. Go to briannicholsshow.com forward slash shop. And what you can do is that will bring you right over to our amazing store. We have a collaboration with Proud Libertarian. And you can go ahead and not only get that awesome don't hurt people and don't take people's stuff bumper sticker, but you can get a slew of other amazing products ranging from our don't hurt people, don't take people's uh, people stuff bumper stickers I mentioned, but also you can get that in t-shirt form. Life gets better t-shirt uh, t-shirt as uh, brought up by the great and one and only Rimzo W. Martinez. Um, we have other stuff like, uh, let's see, we have our question everything snapbacks. We have our good ideas don't require force t-shirt. And of course, one of my favorites, our cups make conspiracy theories, conspiracies again. Folks, if you want to go ahead and check out this awesome, awesome swag, head over to Show.com forward slash shop. And then one final uh, plug, and it's not even really a plug, but more so as a gift, a gift to you, member of the audience who is looking to help sell liberty to friends and family right now. Well, what is it? It's my free ebook. Yeah, and guess what it is? Four easy steps you can go ahead and implement now to help sell liberty to friends and family. Show.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. I was just over on Remzo Martinez's program discussing the book at length. So please go ahead. If you have not subscribed to On the Run with Remzo Martinez, go ahead and do that. That conversation will be coming out early July. And it, the book itself, it, number one, it's free. It's an easy read. It should take you no more than half an hour tops. It's about nine pages, but they're pretty in-depth. And it's going to help give you real life steps you can implement right now that will help you be a better communicator and a better advocate for liberty overnight, instantaneously. So sound interesting? BrianNicholsShow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. Coming up here on Friday, Anna James Ziegler returns to the program. Last time she was on the show, we talked all things Ron DeSantis. This time we're talking about what's next for the Democrats. What happens? Is Joe Biden running again in 2024? Can he? Is that allowed? And, and what happens if it's Kamala Harris who's taking the, the reins? What will that look like? Or will the Democrats look to someone else? We dig into all of that and more on Friday's episode of the program. So that being said, it's Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show for Thomas Queter. We'll see you Friday. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.